Greetings, sisters and brothers. Welcome to African History Club. This is episode number one of the podcast. I'm your host, Milton Alimadi. I dedicate this first episode to my dear friend, Michael Brooks, who passed away this month, and to my dear sister, Barbara Alimadi, who passed away in April. Both of them were great intellectual friends as well. They were my intellectual friends. We exchanged ideas on a constant, regular basis. They greatly enriched my thoughts. And many of you who have intellectual comrades know what this means. So the loss has been profound for me. Michael was the one who encouraged me to launch a podcast focused on African history. Michael, rest in peace, comrade. Barbara, rest in peace, comrade. So let's start on a philosophical note. When Europeans denigrate Africa to the extent of saying that Africa had no history, what does it really mean? What is the purpose? We know what the purpose is. The purpose was to sanitize and justify the crimes committed against Africa. The crime of enslavement the crime of colonial conquest and subjugation, the crime of exploitation of Africa's natural and mineral wealth and Africa's labor, and the contemporary crime of neo-colonialism and imperialism that still hijacks Africa's wealth to benefit the industrial world to the detriment of Africa and holds back the continent in this our 21st century. So let's look at some of the things alleged against Africa, the calumnies against Africa. What did Hegel say in 1831? Well, let me read. Quote, This is the land where men are children. Africa is no historical part of the world. Let's see what Samuel Baker said, racist British imperialist. In his book, Albert Nyanza, in 1866, quote, Human nature as viewed in its crudest state, as seen among African savages, is quite on the level as that of the brute, and not to be compared to the noble character of the dog. This hateful individual was an alleged explorer who went to Africa and then he was guided by Africans who took him to lakes that he then renamed and claimed he discovered. (laughs) Lake Albert in Uganda. Guided to the lake by an African. And then when he gets back to Europe, he's abusing Africans in his book. But Baker's true mission and objective was, number one, simply to map out the continent in preparation for later conquest, colonization, and plunder by the British Empire. But, of course, the evidence contradicts their words and their attempts to cut off Africa from history, when in fact the attempt itself is upside down. It is European history that should be questioned. How can you have a history by cutting off the source of the origin of humankind? That doesn't make sense. In fact, Africa history is all world history because there cannot be any other history without African history. The evidence is now overwhelmingly clear that humankind originated in Africa. 
particularly in the Rift Valley Zone, which includes Ethiopia, which includes what is now Kenya, which includes what is Tanzania, and extending all the way to South Africa. And it's in this zone that some of the most important fossil remains have been discovered of the pre-Sapien ancestors of what is now human beings. So for example, in 1924, in South Africa, the discovery of what was later named the Tong Child, T-A-U-N-G, and I will occasionally spell out these words so people can also conduct their own research. As I said, this is going to be a very interactive history club. And that was dated at 2.8 million years old. And then in Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, the discovery of Zinjanthropus, Z-I-N-J-A-N-T-H-R-O-P-U-S in 19. 59, and that was dated at 1.8 million years old. And then in 1974, the discovery of Dinkinesh in the Afar region of Ethiopia. Dinkinesh is D-I-N-K-I-N-E-S-H. And that was what the Ethiopians named this fossil and otherwise known also to the outside world as Lucy. And of course, in terms of sapiens, the earliest discovery was also made in Africa. And these date to 200,000 years old. There have been discoveries in other parts of the world, including in Asia and in Europe, but none of them come close in terms of the age, in terms of how old these remains are. They don't come to close to the 200,000 year old fossil remains of sapiens discovered in Africa. So this has always been an inconvenience, a major inconvenience to Europeans who would like to delink the evolution of Europeans and to try to claim that we do not have a monogenetic lineage, that we are all ancestored from, we are all descendant from the original lineage, from the Rift Valley zone. So they even came up with a monogenetic claim. And the most preposterous manifestation of this was in 1912 when a British archaeologist named Charles Dawson purportedly discovered the remains of what he termed was a pre-sapien, the descendant of European sapiens. He claimed he made the discovery in Sussex in England and produced what he claimed was the skull of this pre-sapien, which had no connection to Africa, he alleged. This was a hoax, which was later on completely repudiated in 1953, after more than four decades, which to me suggests that many in the European Academy who was sympathetic to what Dawson was trying to do to cut off European links to Africa must have been covering up for him. And why do I say this? Because these are supposedly some of the best scientists in the world. How could they not tell that the jaw part of the skull produced by Dawson belonged to a dog? <laughs> How could they not make that distinction? I suppose other parts of the skull might have been human remains. 
but clearly the jaws were from a dog. And yet this was produced and it was entertained for more than four decades by his colleagues and by Dawson himself. And why was it so important for them to try to do that? Well, many people who support the monogenetic theory of human origin are also, not surprisingly, those who claim that Europeans are intellectually superior to Africans. Now, of course, it's very difficult for them to maintain this argument so long as it remains a fact that we are all descendants of Africans from this monogenetic chain, as Professor Anta Diop has clearly shown in his work. Anta Diop, A-N-T-A, D-I-O-P, and his work is the African origins of civilization. So this has always been a very inconvenient truth to those who would deny and cut off Africa from the evolution and from human history. So mankind and womankind after originating in Africa at some point traveled to populate the rest of the world into Asia through the Suez Isthmus and into Europe through the Straits of Gibraltar. And one of the last parts of the world populated by human beings was, of course, the Americas. And that's why the remains that are found in America are those of sapiens. In Asia and in Europe, the Cro-Magnum, Neanderthal, and then Sapiens. None of the earlier stages, none of the remains dating back millions of years, like the discoveries made in Africa, can be found in Europe, which is also another clear manifestation that it was after traveling from Africa to Europe that mankind and womankind populated the rest of the world. And that is why the earlier stages of evolution, fossil remains, cannot be found in Europe, in Asia, in the Americas, but only in Africa. Another strong manifestation and proof of the works of professors such as the late Anta Dio. And of course, after populating other parts of the world, Europe, for example, that was during the Ice Age, when that part of the earth was extremely cold. And it was there and in other parts of the world settled by humans that human beings over periods ranging from 20 to 30,000 years started through adaptation to their physical environment and climactic conditions started taking on different features. And that is why today the earth is populated by human beings with different physical attributes, characteristics, and pigmentation. And that's why we now have so-called races, different races, when in fact we are all descendants of an original monogenetic lineage taking us all way back to the Rift Valley Zone in Africa. So 
when in fact I say sisters and brothers, I actually do mean it. <laughs> we are actually all sisters and brothers. And science has proven that. And I think that's important, that if people were to acknowledge that, the world would be so much, a much, much better place. And if we can't do it in our lifetimes, we hope that the younger generation will have a better shot at it. So now let me take a leap forward from this prehistoric scenario I just went through, which I believe was very critical, particularly to many that are not familiar with this, since it is not widely taught, and for obvious reasons too. If the establishment and the powers that be want to maintain a certain narrative of having Europeans and then the others, and the others can be Africans, the others can be Asians, the others can be Latinx, then of course we can understand why this kind of knowledge and information is not widely taught or disseminated or even discussed in popular media. But now let me move to another stage as we continue our narrative of the African story. Let's go to 10,000 years ago when one of the most important revolutionary events in human history occurred. And that was, of course, the beginning of agriculture. Agriculture now allowed settlements to start forming because womankind and mankind is no longer spending too much time hunting and gathering. They are sowing seeds and reaping the fruits of the harvest. So communal settlements, multiple small settlements, and even well-organized states and empires flourished alongside or near each other throughout Africa. And we will look at a few of them because we cannot look at all of them. But by looking at a few, we'll get a better understanding of the Africa that existed prior to contact with Europeans and European enslavement, and much later on, European colonial conquest of Africa. And some of these strong states and empires formed alongside the great rivers in Africa, such as the Nile or the Niger. Now, in terms of Egypt, we will leave that for a future podcast in September. When I examine Egypt, I would like to do it in conjunction with Nubia, in conjunction with Aksum, in conjunction with Ethiopia. So we will save all of these for September. Today, we'll look at some of the West African empires, and primarily the ones that flourished and became very powerful include Ghana, include Mali, include Songhai, include Kanem. So let's look at Mali, for instance. Mali, as with the others that I just mentioned, Ghana, Songhai, and Kanem, was famous 
for the level of scholarship and participation in scholarship, for agriculture, where step terracing was practiced, where land rotation and crop rotation was practiced, showing knowledge on how to preserve the quality of the soil, where trade was a major industry, particularly trade in gold. These kingdoms maintained their influence and power for at least 12 centuries. And let's look at specifically Mali. We won't have time in episode one to look at all these kingdoms. So let's take Mali for instance. Mali was founded by Sundiata Keita in 1235. And centuries later, the first president of post-colonial Mali different size and configuration of the geography by that time, but still within that wider Mali zone of the ancient empire. The first president, Modibo Keita, was a descendant of Sundiata Keita, and Modibo is spelled M-O-D-I-B-O. Keita is K-E-I-T-A. And his ancestor, Sundiata's first name, S-U-N-D-I-A-T-A. And Mali, like Ghana, Songhai, Kanem, was also famous for its wealth in gold and trade in gold and a standing army very militaristic and these kingdoms also engaged in warfare of conquest as they expanded one of the most famous rulers of Mali was Mansa Kankan Musa and one incident in particular gained him global notoriety. It was in 1324 when he traveled to Mecca on the pilgrimage. And he traveled with 100 camels carrying gold. And much of this was spent while he was in Egypt and this massive infusion of gold into the Egyptian economy upset, upturned, and destabilized the economy of Egypt. Timbuktu, which was the most important city, not only for Mali, for Songhai, and for the rest of the world, because it engaged in commerce, particularly trade in gold, with Europe and other parts of the world. And Timbuktu was also very famous for the university at Sankore, S-A-N-K-O-R-E. And Sankore University was a collection of many schools all engaged in scholarship. It traces its history to 989 AD in the 10th century. And let me give you a comparison. Harvard University was founded in 1636. Yale was founded in 1701. University of Oxford, 1096. 
And all of these come after the university at Sankore, 989 AD. And in Sankore, the students, the scholars, were engaged in teaching or learning mathematics, physics, chemistry, philosophy, language, linguistics, medicine, physiology, and other disciplines. This is a glimpse of the Africa that existed before the engagement with Europeans and the era of enslavement, which of course is going to be the subject of one of our subsequent podcasts. But this was the Africa. And yet Europeans or descendants of Europe who wrote about Africa willfully disregarded or never mentioned or were completely ignorant of the thriving civilizations in Africa. In some cases, as I indicated in the beginning of this podcast, it was willful and malicious because the objective was to enable conquest, plunder, and exploitation. You cannot exploit, enslave, or colonize unless you justify it in your home country in what later on was referred to as the metropolis without indicating to your own citizens that the people we're abusing are actually not human beings like we Europeans are. So that was part of the reason. Part of the reason could have also been utter complete ignorance combined with rationalization and justification or exploitation. So let me give you a, another example. Thomas Jefferson, the so-called founding father of these United States, when he wrote Notes on the State of Virginia, published in 1785, I think there was an edition that had been published prior to that, but I think it was modified prior to the 1785 edition. So in his book, he demonstrates utter ignorance about a civilization that thrived in Africa, about the monogenetic lineage and the fact that he himself was of course a descendant of Africa. So what does he write in his book? He writes that black people and in his book it's clear that he's referring to Africans as well. He interchanges the usage are intellectually inferior to white people. He says he hazards this conclusion. In other words, he's speculating because it can only be determined scientifically if the skull of an African were to be opened and the brain uh, examined. So he was a forerunner to many of these racist and racialist experiments that later on became routine, of course, in Western societies. But this is what he also writes. 
he writes that his evidence is also based on the fact that Africans had no knowledge of Euclid and is referring to the great mathematician from the fourth century BC. And of course, he can only come to that conclusion having not known of the existence of the university at San Corre. And he gives another example. He says that Africans, unlike Native Americans, and refers to them as Indians, mm -hmm. the Native Americans, Africans cannot produce works of art, intricate carvings and sculptures like Native Americans, which to him was also a demonstration of African intellectual and artistic inferiority. And of course, the good founding father was completely ignorant of the intricate, meticulous, and spectacular artwork, the bronze sculptures and carvings of Benin, which are some of the most renowned artwork all over the world, plundered art, which, as some of you know, there's now a global campaign to return the plundered artwork, including the spectacular Benin art, African art that are in the world's famous museums in New York, in London, in Paris, and in Germany to return these artworks to Africa. And that is also going to be an issue of a future podcast. So this brings us to the conclusion of episode number one. For your reference, I would like to recommend some books. The African Origins of Civilization by Anta Diop, A-N-T-A-D-I-O-P, A General History of Africa, Volume 2, by UNESCO, edited by Mokhtar, M-O-K-H-T-A-R, The Groundings with My Brothers, by Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, by Walter Rodney. I also recommend these two documentaries. Africa, A Voyage of Discovery, episode number one, by Basil Davidson. Second is an interview with Anta Diop, conducted by Listervelt Middleton. These documentaries are available on YouTube. In episode two of this podcast, which is next Monday, we will look at Ghana, we will look at Songhai, we will look at Benin, we will look at Kanem, we will look at Mwene Mutapa, the great Zimbabwe. And all these kingdoms will give us a better understanding of the Africa that prevailed prior to the engagement with Europe and the enslavement regime, and much later, the colonization regime. See you next Monday. I'm your host, Milton Alimadi. 
I hope you can let others know about African History Club. Thank you.